The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alex Salazar. I am from the 22033 Biofuels Group. And today we're going to give you a progress report on our project of integrating biofuels production into a nuclear reactor complex. So basically, I'm going to go through the overall design um, of our process, go through each of our individual steps. I'm going to first start out talking about switchgrass, uh, RP stock. Uh, then we have uh, Lizzie talk about our civil gasification process. We have Matt talk about acid gas removal. And uh, Ogi is going to talk about our Fischer trough reactor. And then Ogi and Catherine will finish up just talking about distillation and refining. So, this is our overall process. Um, so basically, we start from right here with the injection of the piece stock into the process, and we end with distillation and refining and shipping. Um, I'm going to deal with uh, our feedstock. So bringing switch gas from the farm all the way up to the reactor complex. Uh, then here's Lizzie's area. This is the whole, s in the dotted lines, we have the silver, uh, silver gas process, which includes gasification and combustion and cycloning of the ash waste. From there, we uh, come to a heat exchanger. Uh, at this point, this is where we interact with process heat and we actually give heat from the reactions to process heat so they can continue to give heat both to us for gasification and to other, uh, into hydrogen or wherever else it's needed. Um, from there, with the lower temperature of syngas that comes out, uh, mass can deal with acid gas removal. Um, and we're going to need some more uh, input from there. Uh, after that's filtered through, we're going to go to the Fischer trough process. We're always talking about that. There, we interact with the hydrogen process. We get both, uh, we get hydrogen from them, and, uh, and later on, we're also going to get, employ hydrogen into our refining procedure. Uh, we're also going to employ a coolant loop using a natural reservoir, a lake. After the Fischer trough process, we're going to go on to distillation and refining. And then uh, we're going to get into more detail in all of these processes. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about pelletization. So um, if you remember from last lecture, we decided to choose switchgrass because it's, a, um, it's highly viable in dry climes. Um, it's, it multiplies very easily. And it's not competitive with any food crops. Uh, we also chose it because it has a high energy density. Uh, instead of growing on site, we decided to outsource the procedure to farmers because it's more economical. There are already extant networks of switch gas uh, production and processing uh, transport networks. So we're going to go ahead and take advantage of that. Before we could uh, inject switch gas into our process, we're going to have to densify it. So we get the raw product and we put it into a uh, pretty much a pelletization machine where under about 1,000 megapascal is condensed into um, pellets that are about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter of density. And about half of that is the lignin and the cellulose, which is where we get the energy from. Um, yeah. Here's a, uh, a force diagram. So uh, it's comparing three to di four different kinds of feedstock. So we have uh, wheat straw, barley, corn, and then switchgrass. Switchgrass is right here. As you can see, over time, switchgrass requires more force for it to be compacted into a particular form. That's because when you compress switchgrass, there's certain pores, micro pores that you need to like fill in, um, which is good because even though this might impact the total uh, amount of time that in which you'll be able to receive this feedstock, it, it's good because we'll get more bang for the buck. There will be more uh, biomass per unit volume. Um, in, that, in our last lecture, we suggested having a moisture content of about 12%, but now we changed that uh, to 20%. Um, this is based upon uh, the uh, modeled processes for the uh, mo for gasification, pretty much. Uh, 
That shouldn't be a problem. I mean, switchgrass is probably get to that level just in the field. I mean, you don't really need that much to get to 20% moisture. But in any case, the farmers could use a dry storage facility to get it to a uh, engineer 20% moisture content. Um, considering that we do have water present in these um, in our feedstock, we had to calculate the extra uh, hydrogen and oxygen in our uh, gasification reactions. So that influenced the uh, total output flow of syngas from the gasification uh, gasifier. Um, I don't. There's no. I don't think there's a need for us to separate such grass into its components, such as its roots, uh, seeds, stems, leaves, etc. Um, I think it's just more efficient just to compress the entire product. And the goal of our reactor is to have a 3,500 ton per day output, which would require about 53, around 50 kilograms per second of biomass input. So next I'm going to talk about the gasification process. Um, Gasification and combustion often occur together, but there are a number of problems with this, such as if you are combust you're doing combustion using air, you get a lot of nitrogen that dilutes your syngas. Um, there are some other issues with trying to separate how much of the seed stock gets combusted versus how much gets actually converted into carbon monoxide. There's a lot of equivalence ratios to deal with. So we actually decided to use the silva gas process, which is a patented process for gasification, um, to avoid some of these problems because what a lot of gasifiers do since they don't want the dilution from air is they use an oxygen air separation unit to get oxygen. But that also takes a lot of extra energy to separate out oxygen. So there are a number of what they call dual fluidized beds available. The most common one in the US is the silver gas process. There are a couple in Europe that are also pretty heavily researched. And the way this works is we have the gasifier separate from the combustor. So the feedstock is here, and it gets fed into a gasifier with steam. And that reaction produces the syngas, which is mostly CO and H2. Um, but the problem is that we need a lot of heat to make this reaction occur. So then we have the combustor in a separate unit next to it. And you input air at about 300 Celsius, 350 Celsius. Um, and this air actually combusts with some of the char from the gasifier, and that will create enough heat, which then gets sent back to the gasifier. So the tricky thing is that the way the heat gets sent back and forth is there's sand that can carry the heat without, having, without mixing the two gas components of it. So from the gasifier, we get syngas. And from the combustor, you get a lot of what's called flue gas, just extra things, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. And those can get processed different ways. So you can see there's actually a lot more inputs and outputs than we expected when you start looking at the details of the process. Um, the two that we've coordinated with, or trying to coordinate with the process heat group are the steam inputs, because we need steam at 182 degrees Celsius, and also the after the syngas comes out from the gasifier, it's separated by a cyclone to get rid of a lot of the large particles, and then it needs to be cooled before it can be further processed and purified. A lot of other heat areas we are still looking into, such as the waste heat recovery, whether we can do something with the flue gas that comes out. There's air that needs to be heated, but we might be able to just use electricity from the core and directly heat that. And then there's also some wastewater that will come in later with the acid gas removal. So these are some of the main inputs and outputs. Um, we so far have just done a mass balance on what will go in and out. Based on the 5,300 kilo, kilograms a day, we will input about 41 kilograms per second of dry biomass at 20% moisture. Um, you can see the steam inputs, the air inputs, and the total that will come in and out. And then on the side here, you can see a picture of what just the gasification part of the plant looks like. 
The cyclones in the green and orange are about 48 feet tall. You can see the truck at the bottom, so that gives you an idea of how large these plants are. Um, and we did some mass balances just to check that the amount of, um, based on the composition of switchgrass, the amount of carbon and hydrogen oxygen going in matches or is greater than the amount that we're going to be having in our output of syngas. And then this will be the likely composition of the syngas that gets sent on to the rest of the cycle. This is based on Silva gases patent and what they've published for their percentages. You can see it's mostly carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The biggest problem is the carbon dioxide, which actually poisons the fischer tropsch reactor. So we have to remove the carbon dioxide from the syngas. And Matt is going to talk about that next. So I will be talking about the acid gas removal. And this is a very important part in the process because after this, it is sent to the FT reactor. And as is the raw syngas coming out of the silica gas process and the combustor particularly, has a lot of particles, uh, solid particles, and uh, um, particles such as ammonia, H2S, that would uh, poison the FT reaction. So we have the silica gas process here. And this is the acid gas removal portion included in these cyclones. Uh, it's important to note the whole acid gas removal process, even though part of it is in a patented silver gas process. So this is the uh, overall flow chart of what happens in acid gas removal. So we begin with the cyclones, and this is to remove the particulates, uh, mainly char, and what happens is it's a cyclone, a centrifuge, and removes the char. It gets recycled back to the combustion and then combusts there. So it's a closed loop. Uh, next, uh, we have a tar reformer. And I have, this is actually not in our process, but I thought it was important to note because usually you would have some kind of tar reforming, which you would just send uh, the gas through a catalyst. It would break up the heavier particles into smaller one, which is what we want. We want CO and H2 in our syngas. But because of the efficiency of the silver gas process, we is, it is not needed. Uh, then we go to the syngas cooling. And we're going to cool it from, we have an output temperature now of 682C, and we need to cool it to 102C. And so uh, we're going to have a heat exchanger, and we're going to be uh, coordinating with the process heat to make this happen. Uh, next, it goes through a water scrubber, and this is, again, to remove any impurities. Uh, we have a mass flow rate of water in, and that can be adjusted to quench the syn gas to the temperature that we need. It also removes any particulate, like heavier uh, particles that we do not want. It helps uh, there. Uh, after the scrubber, we go to the compressor, and it compresses it to about uh, 30.7 bar and before it's sent to the actual acid gas removal. Uh, this is because at higher pressures, you have a higher solubility and it's easier to deal with. Uh, and so then I'll, I'll talk about more in depth the acid gas removal and uh, patented uh, low cap process that we're going to use. So this is the amine plant. So you'll have sour gas. Sour gas is just uh, syn gas with extra particles that would poison FT reactors, such as H2S, ammonia, particulates, such as uh, these kind of things. So first, it's sent to a filter and a separator. Uh, and from uh, there, I mean, this will remove any of like the solid particles, obviously, that aren't gas. Uh, it's moved to a mean contactor. We have a catalyst in here. And uh, from here, it'll get moved to a heat exchanger. Uh, which then uh, send gas that is uh, like CO and H2, mainly what we want, will get sent to another cooler, get sent back to the main contactor, and be the treated product gas that we want. And uh, it'll move on to the low cat process. But on this over here, uh, any of the heavier particles that we don't want, the, such as CO2, H2S, uh, these particles are sent to an amine regenerator. 
this is, these, these are all things that are patented and we're going to just simply buy them from the manufacturer. So we're working, still working on research to what exactly uh, we need to get and uh, we're reading papers on uh, more or less better ones to use, why and why not, at low pressures and the temperature that we want. So, and then acid gas will come out and we will uh, do something with that. So now we have uh, the low cap process. So after it comes out of the mean uh, process, it goes to another patented process, the low cap process. So we have, again, sour gas coming in and it goes to, and this is an auto circulation. Uh, we have air coming in so we can get uh, a little bit of oxygen in there as well. And we have, uh, this is, so the first process will uh, reduce the amount of H2S and CO2. Both of these are the main concerns in our poisoning of the FT reactor. Uh, but this low cat removes, uh, I mean, lowers the concentration of CO2 and H2S further such that we can have an extra clean syngas when we send it to the FT reactor. And uh, I mean, we're going to use an iron, iron catalyst here. It's environmentally safe. And uh, the vented gas, as you see right here, was ready then to go to the FT reactor. And Ogi will talk to you about that. Table is basically showing uh, the sink gas composition <coughs> that's coming out of the acid gas removal. So we basically have a lot of uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. We removed all of the carbon dioxide because <coughs> that that's the the poisons the FT reaction and we, uh, uh, the whole point of acid gas removal is just to uh, remove CO2 and also H2S that may be around. So FT reactor comes in the late stage of the process. So it comes after the acid gas removal and before the distillation process. So the type of reactor we are going to use is called slurry phase bubble column reactor. Uh, so what we have is um, syngas coming from the bottom of the reactor and bubbled through this tall column. And we also have this coolant tubes along the uh, height of the vessel. The vessel is like is uh, 30 meter tall and seven meters in diameter. And uh, we have uh, two phase flow here, a gas, and uh, gas and liquid. And the flow regime that we're gonna use is called churn turbulent. And uh, we chose this because it's uh, the, lit the articles we looked at uh, said that the churn turbulent is the most efficient in terms of the mass transfer and also heat transfer. Uh, inside the reactor, we have inert oil. And in that oil, we have a catalyst suspended. Uh, and in terms of the catalysts, uh, rubidium is the most active one, but it's uh, very expensive, so it's impractical. Uh, none of the articles we looked at used rubidium as a catalyst. So the, m the most favored ones are uh, iron and cobalt. Uh, in this specific design, we're going to use iron as a catalyst, uh, and uh, it's also possible to use um, cobalt instead. Um, so these are the chemical reactions that take place. Uh, so we have uh, carbon monoxide reacting with hydrogen and making this methylene group, CH2, and the water molecule. And this process, this reaction produces uh, 170 kilojoules of heat per mole. There's also a secondary reaction that also takes place uh, uh, it's called the water shift reaction. So basically we have a water molecule reacting with the carbon monoxide. And instead of making the methylene group, we are making hydro, uh, carbon dioxide. So this is bad. Uh, instead of making like f uh, fuel molecules, we're making useless carbon dioxide. So it's, we want to avoid this wa water shift reaction as much as we can. And that's one of the reasons we chose uh, iron as a catalyst because iron is not active to is very little active to the second uh, reaction. And the methylene groups polymerize into large molecules, large, long um, paraffin molecules. So that's the main components of the fissure drops liquid that's coming out of this reactor. So uh, 
So we did calculations for the total heat generated in our reactor. So we can just uh, multiply the flow rate of hydrogen with the amount of heat generated per, per mole. And we can end up saying 21.8 megawatts of heat is generated. So uh, this reaction has to take place in isothermal conditions. So this heat needs to be taken away. And we talked to the process heat group and we'll most likely be dumping and this much heat into uh, environment. So uh, there's, uh, there's a limit of uh, temperature increase uh, we can do on the intake war uh, uh, imposed by the EPA. So I looked up the number, it's uh, 11 Celsius. Uh, so we can use that number and calculate that the total flow of intake water in our coolant system is 470 kilograms per second. We realize it's a large number, so if it turns out it's not feasible to do it, we'll probably be doing cooling tower. So this pro product selectivity, I, I told you before that those small methylene molecules uh, form long chain molecules. And all of, so these long chains have certain carbon number, carbon atom number. So this plot is showing the mass mass fraction as a function of carbon number. So um, carbon number six will co correspond to uh, benzene molecules or things like that. Um, uh, carbon number one to five will correspond to gas molecules such as methane, ethane, butane, and things like that. So uh, our, so this uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann-like distribution is actually called Anderson it's not Ma Maxwell Boltzmann, but it's called Anderson Schultz Flurry distribution. We have the functional form for this um, distribution. And the shape depends on the uh, hydrogen to carbon monoxide ratio in our sink gas. So also it, it also de depends on the temperature. So this plot is just showing uh, distribution functions for different hydrogen to carbon monoxide ratios for, uh, for example, uh, this one is for uh, ratio equals five. So it's a very high ratio. Uh, th this means we have a lot more hydrogen in our stream than uh, carbon, uh, carbon monoxide. So you can see that this solid line is peaked in a low carbon number range. So that means that we are making a lot of gas instead of gas, but not as much as heavier molecules, which actually become gasoline and uh, diesel. So if you go to low uh, H2-to-CO ratio, you're actually increasing the percentage of high molecules you are making in terms of the mass flow. So this is the actual design we are doing. Th these are the uh, result of the calculations uh, that we did. And the total gas mass flow, which is carbon number from 1 to 5, is and 3.9 kilograms per second. And you can also see the <coughs> heavier uh, mass flows. NAFTA is just, yeah, yeah. Carbon number five to 12 is cal classified as NAFTA, and it, that be eventually becomes gasoline. Yeah. Uh, okay, Catherine will talk about distillation. So the next two processes are distillation and refining. Um, so in terms of distillation, what we're going to do is we're going to use a um, fraction, fractionated distillation tower. Um, so basically, the Fischer Tropes liquid comes into the, um, the bottom of the tower uh, via a furnace um, without air, because we don't want to ignite the, the liquid. Um, and so we're going to heat the, the liquid, or the Fischer Tropes liquid to 350 degrees Celsius using um, the natural gas that's burned um, from the Fischer Tropes um, process. And when we, um, when we heat the liquid, um, all the fractions in the liquid are gonna boil. And so as they boil, they're gonna, um, they're gonna travel up the, the tower and when they reach their boiling point, they're just gonna condense on the trays. And so the trays are gonna have 
bubbled uh, bubbled gas through the um, the trays to help them condense on the trays. And then when they uh, condense on the trays, they're gonna uh, reliquify, and then uh, each tray is gonna be separated. So what we end up having is each fraction um, come like separated into the trays. Um, so here on the right side, you can see what the boiling points for each of the different um, types of fractions that we have in our liquid. And um, for the heavier wax paraffin, it's not gonna boil, or some of it's not gonna boil, it's gonna remain in the liquid form. Like the stuff that enters with the boiling point higher than um, 350 is not gonna boil. So with that, we're gonna need to, um, to redistill it but we're gonna redistill it in vacuum so that we lower the pressure, we lower the, temp the boiling point temperature, um, and that's gonna save us energy in the long run. And then with the light naphtha and the heavy naphtha, when it comes back down after it's liquefied, it's gonna be really, really hot. And we're gonna use a heat exchanger to take some of that heat out of the, um, the naphtha product and put that into our Fisher Tropes liquid before it enters this cooling tower, so we're going to preheat the liquid, and that's also going to save us on energy costs. Um, so that's the distillation process that we're going to use, and it's used commercially in a lot of petroleum uh, refining. So, um, and then then we're going to go to a refining unit, and so the Syncrude from the Fisher Tropes process produces um, things that we want, like linear paraffin, paraffins and, um, and like cyclic aromatic molecules, but it also has olefins and oxygenates that we don't want. So we need to further refine this stuff to get rid of those things. And so what we do, um, the goals of the refining process are hydrogenation of the olefins, um, we want to remove the oxygen-containing com compounds. We want to like uh, further desulfurize, like just with the um, impurities that are in um, the fissure tropes liquids that didn't get removed via the acid gas removal. Um, and we want to hydroisomerize, which is going to increase our octane um, number, which is. Um, there's like a minimum number, I believe it's 87 for gasoline in the United States. Um, so that's going to increase our branching. And then we're going to also hydrocrack um, the long uh, normal paraffins to isoparaffins. And that's also going to increase our octane number. So the process that we chose, the process that we chose to do this is a process that was, that's used by Saysaw and Chevron. Um, and this is what the flow chart for this process looks like. Um, and you can see that we do have, we have naphtha hydrotreating and distillate hydrotreating um, and wax hydrocracking, which is going to um, create the, the isoparaffins that we need. Um, but with the, this process is used because the naphtha hydrotreating is often difficult to do. It's, it's hard to take the naphtha product and get it to the form that we want it in. So it also includes a isomerization, um, which is going to increase the octane number, and a catalytic reforming process, which, um, which is an optimal technology used for, um, for um, isomerizing the, um, the naphtha product. And so this, this catalytic reforming it has a uh, hydrogen output, and so we can use the hydrogen also um, for some of our refining processes. So circled in red are all the places that we need, we're going to need hydrogen, and so we're going to be talking more with the hydrogen group on how to, like, how much hydrogen we're going to need and where um, those pro that hydrogen is coming in. Um, and the final product is the gasoline blend stock and the diesel blend stock. Um, right now, I'm currently looking into more about um, what, what the details of the hydro treating and the hydro cracking and the isomerization are, but those are standard processes that Saysol Chevron uses, so we should be able to get all the details out. So this is just uh, <coughs> converted all the mass flows into tons per day. Uh, as I told you before, the light gas stream was 
four point something kilograms per second. You can just convert that to tons per day. So uh, light gas we're not going to use uh, for anything useful. The diesel and gasoline are the useful petroleum products. So the total petroleum product we're making is 1,450 tons per day. So just to give you an idea of how much petroleum that is, you can just assume like one average car takes about 10 gallons uh, of gasoline uh, to fill up its tank. And we can just do simple calculations say, end up saying our plant is provides enough ga gasoline for 53,000 cars per day. So that's almost the size of a small city. So our plant is fairly large in size. Uh, so Lizzie will talk about CCS. OK. Um. One of the main concerns with our plant that we wanted to highlight was the carbon dioxide management because one of the points of the plant is to not have much carbon emissions. So you might have noticed we do have to remove carbon dioxide from the process during the acid gas removal and also during the distillation process. So there's some options that we can do with this carbon dioxide. We have seen Rentec is one of the companies that actually currently tries to sell. They their carbon dioxide to other plants that I think they're like gasoline plants or other refineries also. So not quite sure on that, but they do try to sell their carbon dioxide. That's an option. Other options are to inject it into underground storage, which sort of then filters into the soil, or to dissolve it deep in the ocean. Um, although so, I've <laughs> So the way you do is, uh, so we, the, the, and uh, we looked at General Electric's carbon dioxide management system. So it's a commercially ready technology. So uh, the way they do it is they just compress the CO2 to 200 bars of pressure, and CO2 becomes liquid at 300 kilograms per meter cube. And the, you, then you just send that liquid the CO2 to, to wherever you want to store. And it has to, the pressure has to be high enough so that the uh, CO2 remains liquid. So the means, like, if you want to dissolve it into deep ocean, you have to <coughs> inject it at least three miles deep into the ocean. So, yeah. So that would be a fun process either way. Um, in conclusion, then, um, we do have some inputs and outputs. We have the general mass flow of what's happening, but there are a lot more inputs and outputs than we expected, I guess, from just, it's a very large plant. Almost every component of our process, if you look here again, can be a plant in itself. The gasification part, the acid gas removal, all these are different patented processes. But we will try to work very closely with the other teams to make sure that all the numbers match up. The main areas for each team then for the with the core some possible places we need electric inputs would be for the gasification heating the air for gasification um, for acid gas removal possibly in the fissure trills process and in the distillation process where we also need to heat it for the liquid to evaporate and do the distillation um, some places we might need heat exchange. We talked about the steam gasification and also when we cool the syngas, we're working with process heat on that. There are some possible heat places where we could give it to process heat or we could just sort of give it to the environment. And then um, for hydrogen, we need hydrogen in the fissure trose process and in the refining. So that's... Um, the next step in our research then is we have started putting these numbers into ease to try and come up with the final sort of energy in and energy out and make sure everything does add up, even though our mass flow rate should add up based on all the different patents and processes that we've looked at. We're still trying to see if we can get Aspen Plus to do modeling because this really is like a chemical engineering plant and that's the program that's most popular for um, these modelings, but it might not happen in the time that we have to do this research. So are there any questions that we can take? Yes, Lauren. <coughs> I'm 
just oh. an alternative? It's either one, I think. I think it will depend on what is easier for heat process and for core. So in some cases, it seems like if you guys are dealing with a lot of different loops already, it might be easier to just transport electricity. So we, have, we also have some uh, waste light gases. We can burn that light gas to heat up the air. So also for the distillation, it has to be raised to 350. And we are also thinking of using the waste light gas. Instead of just burning it, we, we can just use the heat to heat up wherever we need heat, instead of using the electricity. We could, I guess in some way we could also reroute heat from, uh, from the syn gas, the gasification reactions into re reading the air. But, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so if you're just going to use electricity and your own heat to heat up other parts of your system, how does the biofuels plant then, how is it specifically coupled to a nuclear reactor? I mean, you could have a coal fire plant there and it would work just as well. I guess we could. The idea was that we are moving away from using coal-fired plants, right? That was part of the project also is what can we do with a nuclear-powered electric plant, assuming we already have the nuclear plant, something else we could do with it. Because even, I was under the impression that even when we are using things from the process heat, we're not taking the steam directly from the nuclear reactor, right? We're taking the heat from it. So we will try to use as much of that heat as possible. Yes? Um, so you mentioned like you have to make the switch grass a lot more dense. But do you actually have a process that you've researched to actually make that, to make the switch grass dense? They already exist. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you just like the tension, because I don't know if you have, like that was going to be on your yeah, property basically. or before you truck it. Or no, we're stopping it property, we're outsourcing it, we're having it shipped. And basically, I'm not imagining uh, shipments that are fed to some sort of conveyor system that are fed into a lock hopper, which goes directly into our gasification process. So it has to be identified before you ship it, because that's the main problem with shipping biomass, is that it's very expensive to ship yeah. if you don't. And it's also, we're just trying to minimize the carbon emissions, because we can't sequester carbon emissions from a truck. Any other questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The hydrogen to carbon monoxide ratio, is that a volume ratio or a mass ratio? Um, um, volume ratio. Volume ratios. <coughs> well, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, so, I, you know, I like that Aditi was saying, well, why not just use a coal plant over a nuclear plant? But part of that is, you know, a heat source is a heat source, but a nuclear plant is a carbon-free heat source. Then going on that theme, anytime you see yourself using electricity or burning gas <coughs> in order to create heat, that would be fine for a standalone plant, in my opinion. Uh, if you have no other source of effectively free heat, then that's the obvious choice. However, anytime in this scenario that you see yourself using uh, your own products to make heat that also produce CO2, you can save on the CO2 and possibly sell those light gases by employing more of the process heat which I think would be the most efficient use of not just the resources to your group, but the resources for everybody. So in my opinion, anytime you see yourself using electric heaters, try and see if you can use direct heat to heat, because then you, lose, then you don't lose that you know, two thirds of a thermal to electric efficiency. Mm -hmm. Or what do you guys think about that? Yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, but mm -hmm. there aren't so many places that we use electric heaters. Uh, so maybe like one or two places. Yeah, we can definitely try to do, uh, use uh, I think heat from the process. We mostly, um, because this is a class project, are afraid of overburdening the process heat group because our numbers do seem to be constantly changing because there were so many processes that we were looking at. And as you look into one, you find that there's another competitive pro another competitor's process who works a little better, but then it changes a lot of the numbers each time. So. It's a lot of iterations, yeah. Now, are there any places where you think you absolutely have to use electric heating or syn gas? Yeah, we need electricity to uh, cool our methanol for injection of acid gas. Okay, so that has to go below any heat sink that you have. Yeah, very cool. Okay. It should be the only one, I think. Anyone else? Tarell, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, 
I guess on what you just said, is there, I guess, a way that you could do like a two-stage cool? I mean, essentially use <coughs> processes to remove it to a certain temperature, that way you don't have to suck all that. Just a bunch of con loop condensers. It's yeah. usually done in three stages. The, the amount of temperature drop that we're dealing with is usually done in three stages. Okay. So that's what we're planning on doing. We just don't have all the components necessary to put it in. But the first stage is we are using process heat. That's a really big drop from about 700 Celsius to yeah. 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Um, now, uh, Matt, you're talking about one one of your slides had a filter, and it's like the first stage is you're going in uh, purifying your sour gas. I guess. How often do you have to change that filter? Is it easy to change? Do you have to shut down the whole plant to change it? Uh, you, you will have to shut down. So we're uh, estimating about 20 hours a day. And so in those four hours, we would do things like change a filter. Uh, it doesn't need to be changed that often. I don't have a number right now because we're not exactly sure which uh, company we're going to go with and the number changes from company to company. Okay. But it is on the order for like weeks and sometimes months. So. Okay. Um, and then you're also showing that sour gas was going in to your first that amine stage. Yes. And then it, you also had it going into your next stage. So uh, that's kind of a, a rough definition. Sour gas, we still consider it because it's kind of relative to what's coming out. Second part, it's coming out of the first acid gas removal, that amine removal, and going into the low cat. The low cat is a more technical process that will further lower the, the short down ratio of like hydrogen and CO2 uh, to what we need. I mean, we need something like 98% uh, CO2 removal because CO2 is highly favored over CO in the FT reaction. So we basically need to remove as much as possible. I mean, it's more of uh, a process that doesn't require a lot of power or uh, things like that. And then the low cat is a more technical process, which we would be able to lower it to the very low degree. So the first one's just a course filter, the yes. second one's fine. Um, I don't think we may actually have oh, okay. as long as 10 of them. Yeah, so. sorry. Did Rory? Oh, oh. Well, just quick I, I think I missed it, but um, how, like, in a year, how long would this run for? And is it the kind of thing that really struggles with shutdown, like frequent or infrequent shutdowns? Because I guess you have some, like, very organic stuff going around here, but I'm guessing it doesn't like to sit still. So ideally, with this run, what we do? In our in our calculations, we were assuming about ninety percent running per year. So in uh, about twenty hours a day, and then a couple uh, we do a couple of days. I think at most about three days. Shut down just here and there for maintenance and uh, repairs. So overall, we're assuming about ninety percent running time per year. Like if the tool was to be shut down every for a month, that would be bad. Potentially. On the bright side, it gives us more time for our free stuff to live to acquiesce. All right, we're going to cut it off there just because of the time. So thanks to Biofuels Group. Very thorough presentation on the press. <laughs>